The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of racism, segregation, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is the Honorable David N. Dinkins, the 106th Mayor of New York City. Hi, Dave. Welcome to African American Legends again. Dr. Brown, it's always good to be with the fighter pilot. Okay, well, the fighter pilot's going to start shooting. <laughs> you were the 106th Mayor of the great city of New York. You serve with great distinction, and you're now a professor in New York at uh, Columbia University, which, you, again, you're serving with great distinction. We'll give you a professorial question. How would you rate the state of New York City in the year 2005? Well, um, we're better than we have been, and, and hopefully not as good as we're going to be. Uh, I'm, I'm biased, perhaps, but uh, eight years of Rudy Giuliani, I think, did great harm to our city. In what way? Well, for instance, uh, about two dozen lawsuits were brought around First Amendment issues, and, and I think 23 out of 24 he lost. Mm -hmm. He did such ridiculous things as bring the lawsuit against the New York Magazine for its ad, uh, New York Magazine, the only great thing in New York that Rudy can't claim credit for. He was so incensed that he brought mm -hmm. a lawsuit, not using the city lawyers, mind you, private lawyers paid for with city money. Of course, it, the suit was, uh, was lost, was thrown out immediately. But but the, the the biggest harm he did to our city had to do with the area of uh, criminal justice. Um, the things that have become almost code words, Diallo and Louima and Doris Mon, and uh, I shall never forget uh, Doris Mon. Uh, everybody knows about uh, Diallo. 41 rounds fired, 19 of them struck him. An innocent man doing nothing, committing no crime, had no weapon. And so we're all outraged by that. Uh, and, and, then, and then it was Louima, uh, the man who was sodomized in a police precinct bathroom. Now, the, 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 aside from the dastardly deed that was done, to think that cops thought they could do this in a precinct with impunity. And we know that, that he did it because Officer Volpe confessed, admitted in open court that he did it. He's doing 30 to 40 years now. See, so sometimes... Uh, uh, one gets convicted, and then then later we say, oh, yeah, but he really was innocent. He had an all-black jury or whatever. Not so in this case. Uh, it is What's unclear is those who, who assisted him, and, and that's never been quite cleared up. But Doris Mon, uh, that's the instance of a man, a uh, private security person, off-duty, around midnight, in plain clothes, not a uniform, no weapon, committing no crime, and they attempted a drug sting on him to either sell him drugs or buy drugs from him and he was so incensed outraged that when he expressed this outrage he got into a hustle a tussle with the uh, police officer and two of them and one of them uh, fired and killed him and the mayor later said mayor giuliani said um, well he was no altar boy anyhow first off it's not relevant whether or not he was an altar boy number two happens he was or had been, uh, but uh, the mayor made that comment because uh, uh, he had a juvenile record that was supposed to be sealed. And uh, I think it's just a damn shame that someone trained in the law would suggest that uh, he was no altar boy anyhow. Uh, but the, the, the mere fact that those uh, uh, crime uh, fighters, the uh, uh, the, the cops, what do they call them, uh, street crime unit, street crime unit. They had a slogan they wore on their T-shirts. I'm not suggesting that everyone wore a T-shirt every day, but they had these T-shirts that said, we own the night. And, and, and now, for some people, I, I happen to totally agree that those positions that were taken by Mayor Giuliani were totally wrong. But some people feel that this helped to improve the image of New York City as being a crime-free city, a safe city. Now, I know you've dealt with this issue in your administration because you started a program called Safe Street, Safe City. 
that really increased the number of police officers and provided community policing under uh, Lee Patrick Brown, your commissioner, and then followed by Ray Kelly. So how do you balance that in terms of the public's eye? Giuliani well, is a big hero because of 9-11. At right. the same time, some of the things he did were not consistent with the Constitution of his country. How, how do you balance that? Well, I would remind people, first off, that it's inaccurate to suggest that on December 31st, 1989, there was no crime in New York at that's all. That's when your term ended, right? That, that, no, that's when Ed Koch's I term mean, ended. Ed Koch's term ended, and yours and, began. And then the next day, January 1st, 1990, all is crime. Of course there was a lot of crime then, left over from the day before. Hmm. And, uh, but as you point out, we had our Safe Street, Safe City program. Uh, Dr. Lee Patrick Brown, the wonderful man who was my police commissioner, and he was succeeded uh, by Ray Kelly, who is today the police commissioner in New York City. And so more, more now than before, people are beginning to acknowledge that crime started to go down in New York as early as 1991, certainly in 92. Uh, and so... Uh, it, it is it's a good thing that crime has gone down and Rudy deserves some credit for that although his methods leave much to be desired but he was not the one who did this alone by any means and uh, so I think that that when one looks at crime in New York City I think it's fair and accurate to say that we are the safest large city in the country but many things have contributed to that. Yeah, safest in terms of statistics. That doesn't right. mean there's no crime at all. Oh, absolutely. It means that uh, we have it no, under some time of control. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, safety does not mean a total absence of crime. Uh, but among the things that occurred was uh, the, the, the crack epidemic. And a lot, of, a lot of the crime, a lot of the people who were injured or killed were caught in crossfire uh, in battles among drug lords and so when, when the drug business started to go down all over the country I might add it, it helped us by, here. By the way why do you attribute the drug decline in drug trafficking? Is it federal policy? Is it education? Is it enforcement? What, what brought I, I, that about? I guess, I guess I should first say I don't really know but I suspect that th these things contributed I think people getting uh, edu educated, uh, more jobs, because in many instances, people involved in the drug trade, were that, that was their, I can't call it an advocation, but that's what they did because they couldn't find any other jobs. Now, that's no excuse for one's involvement in, in uh, tra drug trafficking. And uh, it's interesting to note that, that uh, many of the people, most of the people, it seems, uh, imprisoned for dealing with drugs, are people of color. Particularly and, the, the Rockefeller drug laws in right. New York State. And, 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 and these are not the big drug lords, mind you. These are people with, a, with just enough drugs caught on, on them so as to, to be victims of the draconian Rockefeller drug laws, which uh, uh, Rockefeller was, uh, Nelson Rockefeller was known as a liberal Republican, as indeed he was. But the black marks on his career on his legacy are Attica and the Rockefeller drug laws. And it's, it's uh, sad to say he did a lot of good things, I'm sure. For those who don't remember Attica, could you explain well, what Attica, Rockefeller's role was yeah. in that? Well, it was a riot. The, the prisoners had, had taken over uh, at Attica, demanding uh, fit more fair treatment and such. And uh, there were uh, a lot of people who attempted to mediate to resolve it. They included Arthur Eve and Herman Badillo and some others. And there came a time when the governor gave the order uh, for the uh, police and I guess the National Guard to go in. And they went in. A lot of people were injured. A lot of people died. Initially, it was said that some of them had been killed by inmates. But forensic evidence later demonstrated that they were not killed by inmates, but killed by other guards. Uh, you know, in era so-called friendly fire. I never will understand that term, friendly fire. 
But that became a cost to live in the African American community, sure. and it led to some major changes in the penal system. Yes. But at the same time, the Rockefeller drug law, with its mandatory sentences, just filled up the prisons of New York State, and in other places, similar laws filled up those prisons, which got a revolving mm -hmm. door in terms of people in and out exactly. and so on, and the impact on the economy. So here we are in 2005. We've got the crime down. Mm -hmm. What about jobs in New York City? What well, about economics? What about housing? What about that? Well, uh, Freddie Ferrer, uh, when he ran for mayor four years ago, um, had as part of his slogan, the, the tale of two cities, you, Dr. Brown, and I, and many others, have for many years made the point that there are two societies. And so I, I was really a little astounded when, when Freddie was put upon for, for making that point. He said he was dividing the yeah, city. But, but, but the fact, city was already divided. He was right. I mean, I think he was right. And, and uh, so, but we know it's a fact that uh, we, uh, people of color do less well in all the relevant areas, in health care, in, in housing, in jobs. Uh, we, we know, for instance, uh, Dr. Harold Freeman and another physician a few years ago did a paper and, and they pointed out that a black man in Harlem has a lesser chance of achieving age 65 than uh, a resident of Bangladesh. And people were shocked to learn this, but those are the facts. We know also that, that black folks get uh, lesser quality of health care than whites even those who have insurance, even those who are of the middle income range. And, and, and that's just a fact. And, and most physicians seem to know this and will acknowledge it. But again, the role of the mayor is to bring the resources of the city, particularly the public resources, to bear on that. I know in your administration, you made a major thrust in terms of children's services and health services for children. What about today in 2005 in New York City? Has health care improved? Have conditions for the least of us improved somewhat, a lot, or not at all? I, I suspect that they've improved somewhat. Um, we, we, we might have to keep in mind that some of which, uh, that which Mike Bloomberg has, he faces now, is a, a uh, residue of eight years of, of Rudy. And, and Rudy had certain policies, certain attitudes, philosophies, with which I violently disagreed. And one of the amazing things about Mike Bloomberg is his effort to, to try to say nothing ill of Rudy, who helped him get elected, and, and yet diverge as he has in certain areas. He's just done things differently without announcing that he's going to. And uh, I, I am uh, uh, particularly annoyed with the way that the uh, homeless had been treated, uh, the, 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 the way people on welfare. The mayor, Mayor uh, Giuliani, was proud of the fact that our welfare rolls have been reduced from above a million to something like 500,000. Now, that is an accomplishment and, and to be desired. However, the question has to get asked, well, how did you achieve this? And some of the people were just sort of almost put off. Uh, they, they had to satisfy the city that they were, in fact, eligible. And in, that, in, in doing that, some people who were entitled to, for instance, food stamps, which comes from the federal government, and the city does not have the right to, to impose conditions, and the city did, and was criticized, and it came down hard. Federal government came down hard on the city uh, back uh, when when Rudy was doing that, but but the idea was that when they were doing that, when turning people away, uh, that a lot of them just stopped applying. And so when when Rudy was asked, well, where are these people? He would say they're part of the underground economy. And I never really quite understood what he meant. Did he mean that that they were street vendors? They mean they were uh, in illegal activity like drug trades, or well, what? What did he mean by underground economy? And uh, but so some of that, I suppose, obtains to this day. 
but I think we've had big improvements. At least we can we can talk to to uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg. We could not talk to Rudy. I'll never forget the situation we had at the mosque early on in Rudy's term when he refused to meet with uh, black elected leaders, David Patterson and others in Harlem around that. Now, Mike may not give us the answer we want every time, but at least he's, he's uh, I think, accessible. Well, you as the mayor <clears throat> took the lead in bringing the Arthur Ashe Tennis Stadium to New York City. Uh, and you took a lot of heat for that. My, my One thing topic. is that you were a tennis player and said you were favoring yeah. the people that you play tennis with. If I, if and I, the other said this was sort of a luxury. What has been the impact of this stadium and the know, U.S. Open on New York City's economy? You can tell when a friend is interviewing you because he, he asks you such nice questions. <laughs> I love it. Well, the, the, uh, when we, I, I, sh I should tell you, when we took office, we were very concerned uh, about the economy. We were in bad shape. We worried about Morgan Stanley leaving the city. We worried about the United Nations even, because nothing says the United Nations has to be in this country, much less in New York City. And we worried about losing the U.S. Open. They, they, they threatened to go to Atlanta, uh, to the uh, Meadowlands. Uh, they were looking at a lot of places. So we cut a deal with them whereby the city uh, leased to them this, this land, the USTA paid for the stadium, and the city gets uh, a percentage of, of the rent, a, a percentage of gross, I might add, not net, as is the case with uh, Shea and, and Yankee Stadium, so you never have a debate about how much is due. And the, the U.S. Open in two weeks generates more revenue into the economy of the city, the general economy than the Yankees, Mets, Knicks, and Rangers combined in a half season. I noticed you didn't met mention the Jets and Giants, because well, no. they play in New Jersey. <laughs> no, I, I, that's true, Un unfortunately, sad to say. But now, see, I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan, so when the Dodgers left, I just, yeah. <laughs> well, but you took a lot of heat for that, because it was suggested that you are messing with the aeroplanes and making yeah. them change their route and being That's favor, a favoring a, a elite sport. Right. Now, how do you defend yourself against that well, type of accusation? Well, number one, it, it is not any longer an elite sport. Once was. Hmm. Ralph Bunch couldn't join the Forest Hills West Side uh, Tennis Club. Uh, Althea Gibson in 1958 uh, uh, couldn't play, play, couldn't belong to some of the country clubs where she played and won titles. And of course, the famous Arthur Ashe. So, Whom so, the stadium is named after, right. Arthur Ashe Tennis and, and incidentally, the USTA, United States Tennis Association, did not have to name it for Ashe. They could have named it, could have sold the name to Reebok or Nike or whomever. But to their credit, and I had nothing whatever to do with this. I was not mayor when this judgment was made, nor was I then on the board of the USTA. So I had nothing whatever to do with it. But I think the, the, the members of the board of the USTA who took that action, those 15 people deserve great credit uh, if they named that stadium for Arthur Ashe. And it has been widely received, well received widely, uh, internationally and locally. Nobody has said, well, how you name it for Arthur Ashe? Because Arthur was, was such a, a, a magnificent person. He, like Jackie Robinson you have here, uh, they opened doors for others of us in different disciplines. People who didn't play baseball, who, 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 didn't, who didn't play tennis, yet uh, had, had pride in seeing these achievements. And they inspired a lot of, of youngsters, particularly, including white youngsters. They said that if, if these black folks, with the, with the burdens that they've had on them, can achieve, then so can we. And that's why, incidentally, Dr. Brown, that's why the Tuskegee Airmen story is so important. Mm -hmm. Not just to glorify you and Lee Archer and Percy Sutton and all the other wonderful men, but it shows what can be done. You guys had the, the vision, the foresight, the guts, the courage to achieve, and you did. And so others of us in completely unrelated fields 
feel, well, I can do something because look what they did. And you were the 106th mayor, which then yeah. gets to the question of now we have term limits. A mayor uh, can yeah. only say, they, you were term limited by the electorate. They right. didn't, didn't <laughs> re-elect you. But, uh, and I argued personally against term limits. I thought the election is the best way of determining term limits. But there's a law now in New York City, the, the mayor and the uh, public advocate uh, and the controller right. are term limited. And that sets up a whole set of musical chairs for who's going to get to run to be the next mayor and so on. What's your opinion about term limits? Well, I've come to the conclusion that, that term limits for uh, executives and, and for the citywide offices is not as bad as I at first feared it would be. Why? Uh, but I, well, the, 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 the con contrast has to be with term limits for members of the city council. Mm -hmm. I think that is a terrible idea. It's just mm -hmm. awful. Whereas a, a person who can serve eight years, uh, I mean, that's not bad. Uh, we do that with the President of the United States. Incidentally, it's eight consecutive years. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, Rudolph Giuliani could run for mayor. Oh, you? Well, no, my wife won't <laughs> let me. And yeah, I'm too old. I'm, I'm almost as old as you, Dr. Brown. Depends on when you're playing tennis. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, um, the concept of term limits was to provide for a change in the leadership yes. and now a change in the council. You're arguing that in the council where you do um, laws or enforce laws or make laws that affect people for a longer period of time, the council shouldn't change. But on the no, other no. hand, you dealt Not with that the it council. Shouldn't change. Yeah, okay, let's hear it. Not that it shouldn't change, but, but that the, 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 the electorate will make the judgment. See, part of the difficulty with term limits in the legislature is that you, you have very little institutional memory uh, be, because they're gone and, and moreover you, you have a, a great risk, I don't say guarantee, but a risk of the legislature being run by staff and nobody elected them. And so it, 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 it's tough and uh, the speaker of the assembly of the uh, city council uh, who, who really has enormous power can be there very limited period of time. The reason, the rationale in the very beginning for term limits was that it was rare that an incumbent lost an election. So they said, ah, we'll fix them, we'll limit their term. And, uh, but, but that was not a problem at the, at the other at the citywide offices. But you're right when you say because we have these term limits now, people run for offices for which they would not run if they could remain where they are. Is that good for democracy or not? Well, I, I don't know that it's bad for democracy, uh, term limits, if, if it's only, t if you know, two terms is not mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. One could argue there should be three terms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's another way of looking at it. But, but one of the impact of this is in, if someone gets reelected, they're already a lame duck the day they're sworn in and that impacts the way in which they function. Um, some want well, to maintain their legacy, some want to do some yeah, different and kind some, of things. And some will have the great courage to say, well, I, I won't be here anymore. I, I can't seek further election. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to do what I should have done the first four <laughs> years. But that's the, that, that is the beauty, if you call it, of the American system. But my point, of course, is that the voter should have unbridled attempt uh, opportunities to elect whoever the voter wants. Well, the yeah. voter ha almost has that now. But keep in mind the reason that, that those who favored term limits, and I did not, mm -hmm. but those who favored term limits, the reason they came with this idea in the first place was what seemed to be an inability to uh, elect anybody but an incumbent. Which is a very, very good point. But as we come to the close of today's conversation, could you tell us a little about your work with AIDS? Oh, well, um, I was privileged to work with Deborah Fraser Howes, the founder of the Black National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, where you, Dr. Brown, and uh, Dr. Calvin Butts, and uh, Dr. Benny Prim, who I say is a genius, because Benny Prim uh, <laughs> went to med school in two countries where he did not speak the language. Uh, you know, that, that's pretty good. 
Uh, but at any rate, I've been working with, and for, I guess, a half dozen years. I was chairman uh, with Deborah, and uh, I have now been succeeded by Calvin Butts. And uh, I think it's wonderful work. Uh, and, uh, and, and Debbie deserves such credit because she and you and others who came along in this at a time when, when uh, uh, many of our ministers, for instance, said, well, that's just God's way of punishing those people. Where they thought it was a gay white men's disease. So it took a while, but thanks to Pernessa Seal of uh, Baum and Gilead and Deborah Frazier Howes and so many others, we're, we, we're making great progress now in that area. Well, as uh, the 106th mayor, you have gone through a number of things. You've gone through civil unrest. You've gone through uh, rebuilding the police and the crime detection, rebuilding the schools. Which are you most proud of? Well, I, I guess uh, this may not make a lot of sense to some people, but uh, among the things of which I'm most proud was the, the day that we made the judgment with short money. We, we didn't have enough money to go around. We determined to spend $47 million to keep each branch library open six days a week, which may not sound like much of an accomplishment, but it should when one appreciates that this had not occurred for a quarter century. Well, clearly you have made a contribution and impact on New York City. I want to thank uh, David N. Dingett, the 106th mayor of New York City, for being our guest on African American Legends.